Camel Supercross Series opener a week ago on ESPN. Three race favorites, Rick Johnson, Jeff Ward, defending champion Jeff Stanton, stunned by a pack of rookies led by Yamaha's Damon Bradshaw. Can the kids keep it up? Will the veterans come back? Stay tuned. Round two of the Camel Supercross Series is coming up. Welcome to the Coors Extra Gold Super Challenge, round two of the Camel Supercross Series here in the Houston Astrodome. I'm Larry Myers, with me Dave Despain. Dave, if the action here in the Lone Star State is anywhere near as good as it was in the opening round in Anaheim, California, then we're in for a real barn burner. Larry, I gotta think it's gonna be even better. Look at the situation. All the veterans, including four Supercross champions in the field, literally got their tails kicked around the stadium at Anaheim. And the guys who did the kicking were a bunch of series rookies led by the amazing young Damon Bradshaw. I gotta think the veterans are upset. I know their bosses, the team managers are unhappy. I think they're gonna be out for revenge here in Texas. Well, to say the least, they had to have been embarrassed. Let's take a look at last week's opener at Anaheim Stadium, and you'll see what we mean. Season openers always filled with a lot of anticipation. Everybody wants to make a good impression in the first start of the year. What you don't want to do is make that impression in the dirt in turn one, but you just can't fit that many motorcycles through the funnel. The surprise of the evening, number eight, Damon Bradshaw, a series rookie, challenged by the 22 of Jean-Michel Bale, former world champion, and number 20, Jeff Matasevich, another series rookie. The highlight of the evening was a tremendous Bradshaw-Matasevich battle. Here's Matasevich to the inside, runs Bradshaw into the hay bales. Remember, these two kids are making their first appearance in the featured class of this series. Matasevich won the heat. Bradshaw came back with a vengeance in the final. Sets up a beautiful outside move to take the inside line. And through the whoop to deuce, Damon Bradshaw pulls off the pass that made the difference in the main event. Bradshaw goes on while Matasevich falls into the clutches of Bale. Boom! The Frenchman goes by. Matasevich falls to third. Bale takes the runner-up spot. The story the season opener is Bradshaw. What happened to the veterans? Uh, my thoughts on the on the rookies coming in and riding well, real well. Uh, they are riding well. Damon's riding well. Matasevich, uh, John Michelle Bale. Um, I, I expected that. I expected the young riders to come in and uh, you know come in real hard. But uh, this it wasn't my plan to do as bad as I did. But uh, it was my plan to come in easy and start out because it's going to be a consistency uh, factor throughout the whole season. Whoever's going to be the most consistent is going to win. So you know I expect them to be up there but I don't expect them to be up there every race. How can a 17-year-old rider be that good and have that many moves? Well, experience is a lot of it, Larry. The kid's only 17, but he's been racing for 12 of those 17 years. He has tremendous ability. I think he liked the racetrack. He seemed very at home out in Anaheim. And then again, it could have been just one of those one-night flukes. Well, we're about to find out. Tonight is a whole new ball game. And to help you keep track of the action, let's take a look at the track that we've built here on the floor of the Houston Astrodome. Starting gate is 20 bikes wide, but it narrows down in a hurry, and from there it's single jumps, double jumps, triple jumps, a treacherous layout. Let's take a look at it from the Scott Cycle Cam. Jeff Stanton leads the tour. Uh, here we are on the first corner, sharp left, into a backward ski jump. Uh, stadium Dirt Design track Bill John Spinsky builds a long set of whoops. Uh, into another sh sharp left-hand corner. Uh, there's a set of doubles you see now. Uh, most of the riders will be doubling them. Uh, right after the doubles, a long set of triples. Uh, he doubles the last two there, most of the riders will be tripling that. Uh, a set of doubles into another 90-degree switchback, left-hand turn. Uh, here you see a set of, a set of doubles. Uh, some of the riders will be tripling that. There's three jumps there. Uh, here is a jump onto a uh, sort of a, a, a plateau with a jump in the middle of it. You hit it and jump off of it. Uh, Right-hander into a step up. And down the step up into another right-hander with a jump on each side of it. And now, you, now we are at the finish line. Land the finish line and we're done. This 
new home video is packed with the most outrageous and unbelievable moments in Supercross. We'll put you smack in the middle of the action with Jeff Ward, Rick Johnson, Damon Bradshaw, and other Supercross stars as they battle wheel to wheel. From start to finish, it's the best of the best. We put together the most spectacular spills, the highest flying, hardest driving, firm busting, handlebar banging action ever on one home video. Let your VCR bring the most exciting entertainment on two wheels into your living room. There's never been anything like it. Supplies are limited. Order now. I'm Larry Myers. With me, Dave Despain. We're in Houston, Texas for round two of the Camel Supercross Series. And in a very few moments, we're going to take a look at some qualifying action that was held earlier today. But before we do, let's take a look at what it took to make it into tonight's program. Well, let's begin with the heats, Larry. Each rider is assigned to one of the three. And the top five finishers from those three heats go on to the main event. If you finish sixth or below, you get shunted over into the semifinal. The top two finishers from each of the semis go to the main. And finally, there is the last chance qualifier. It's just what the name implies. The winner, and only the winner, goes on to the feature. Now let's take a look at some of that qualifying action held earlier today. Heat race number one, a trio of Kawasaki riders led the way. Johnny O'Mara, former national champion, number nine out in front, followed by the rookie, Jeff Matasevich, then in the number three position, the two-time Supercross champ, Jeff Ward. And Ward blasting by O'Mara on the inside. An excellent line, and that's what experience will do for you. Do it every time. It's important to remember, in heat race competition, the top five go to the main event, but the order in which they finish has to do with gate selection. In other words, if you win, you pick your spot on the gate prior to the guy that got second place. Now, that's why they try so hard in heat races to pull off that win. You've got to be careful here, though, Larry. Teammates racing each other is a team manager's nightmare. They're pretty well strung out now. There's room among them as they take that white flag. Interesting, too, that even in the heat races and even among the teams, this rookie versus veteran story is the headline. O'Mara and Ward both around for a long time. Matasevich, the newcomer. You have to think that O'Mara and Ward are comfortable riding with each other. They've been doing it for years years, but to find their teammate Matasevich coming up and sticking his wheel on the inside can be scary. Now watch this move by Jeff Ward. We're looking at last lap action. Ward gets a drive around the outside of O'Mara. He made sure that it was a good, clean pass. He just wanted it a little worse, I think. He took a gamble, got on the gas real hard through the whoops. That's risky. You can lose it pretty easily. He wanted to beat O'Mara, and once by, he's able to pull away. Again, we look at that gate selection situation. Now Ward will go on to take the win. If his time while taking the win is the fastest of the night he'll have the number one pick on the gate Jeff Ward takes the checkered flag and the win in heat race number one worth noting that uh, Matasevich did slide down late in the race and that broke up the Kawasaki sweep Kudrowski Tishner and Cooper round out the top five Heat race number two was another battle among teammates. This time, the brand was Yamaha. Doug Dubach on the inside. They call him the doctor, rider number seven. On the outside, from Litchfield Park, Arizona, rider number 15, Sean Kalos. Nice move by Kalos outside. We won't see a lot of him in this series. He's bound for Europe in the World Championship Division in the 250s. Dubach, the doctor, got his nickname by visiting every emergency room on the Supercross series. This kid does fall off occasionally because of his aggressive riding style. He's been hurt a bunch, but he doesn't seem to have lost any of the fire. That's a dubious honor, to say the least. Doug Dubach uh, is aggressive. There's no two ways about it. He earned that nickname in his younger days. Past couple of years, Dubach has settled down and has turned in some excellent performances for Team Yamaha. Dubach, one of two Team Yamaha riders, the other, of course, being the upstart, the youngster, Damon Bradshaw. We'll hear more about him a little bit later in the program. But Dubach, rider number seven, did not ride this one error-free. You're going to see coming up. Here it is. Watch him off the side of the track. Whoa, that one was close. It's easy to understand now how he got that nickname, Dr. Shades <laughs> of his younger days. Let's go back and take another look at that, Dave. Nice move on Dubach's part in the getting the front end pulled back into the racetrack. 
see the right leg. He shifts his weight. He gets the front end aimed back in. The back wheel will follow the front in most cases. So even though he exploded the bail, he stayed out of big trouble. Coming up, the checkered flag, and Dubach will hold on to take the win in heat race number two, followed by Sean Kalos. So Kawasaki owned the first heat. This one belongs to Yamaha with Dubach and Kalos. Mike LaRocco comes home third. Fisher and Matson round out the top five, and they all are headed for the main event. Heat race number three was another team battle. It seems like, Dave, this is the night for uh, teammates to go up against each other. In this one, defending Supercross champion Jeff Stanton, rider number one, took the early lead, and he was followed by Rick Johnson, but Larry Ward, another rookie, and these rookies keep propping up aboard the number 17 yellow Suzuki, snuck by Johnson into the number two position, and here comes Bradshaw, yet another rookie and winner of the opening round of Supercross action in Anaheim, California. These riders are seeded into the heat races based on their point standings, and this one is definitely talent-packed. Stanton really getting an opportunity to shine here. Nice move by Bradshaw. Big save off the whoop there. Got real sideways. But as they battle each other handlebar to handlebar, Stanton starts to get away. Here are the two rookies, Ward and Damon Bradshaw, trying to reel him back in. And at the same time, Dave, they're putting on a display of riding talents as they battle each other. Now Bradshaw getting the upper hand over Larry Ward. He moves into the number two position, sets his sights on the rear wheel of the defending champ, Jeff Stanton. Two things to consider here. One, Bradshaw would like nothing more than to go by Stanton, throw some dirt in his face, and that's going to establish him for the main event for the second week in a row. Stanton, on the other hand, the wily veteran, the defending champ, knows he has to make it into that main event in order to score points. He may be content to let Bradshaw go by, but he doesn't want to do that mentally. He doesn't want Bradshaw to know that he's easy pickings out there. He would like to keep the youngster behind him. So we'll see what happens, and there it is. Bradshaw goes high he gets the drive coming out of the corner and there he does he makes the pass nice move but the difference in lines there you saw stanton elect the inside bradshaw said fine i'll go up high and use the uh, use the big berm he maintained a lot more momentum and made the pass and now ward is going to try to close in on stanton ricky johnson number 13 struggling back there in fourth the broken wrist that he suffered last year still very much an issue in his racing life and we have not seen the ricky johnson of old thus far in this series now johnson picks a brand new line on the track. He had been going high, and he picked a new line, and it's going to pay off. He was able to move across the line of Larry Ward and effectively shut Ward's drive down. Uh, Johnson took the line away from him and moved into the number three position. Now sets his sight on teammate Jeff Stanton. Stanton said when this series began, he was going to defend his championship by riding conservatively. He recognized it was an 18-race series. He didn't want to take unnecessary chances early and run the risk of getting hurt. I don't think he was ready for the rookies like number 17, Larry Ward, and number 8, Damon Bradshaw. And Bradshaw has really shown the veterans the short way around the racetrack in heat race number three. There you get an idea of the lead that Bradshaw has opened over Jeff Stanton, rider number one, who's in second, and his teammate Rick Johnson, number 13, who is closing on Stanton in the number three position. The two riders side by side as they go over the double and triple jumps in this Houston track. Now Stanton on the outside is being passed by Rick Johnson. They take the white flag, one lap to go, and Johnson is looking good. He He's caught fire all of a sudden. Interesting rivalry here. These guys were the best of friends when Ricky Johnson was the champion and Stanton was the challenger. They were both teammates. Ricky got hurt. Stanton took away the championship. He says that maybe the friendship has uh, cooled just a little bit now that they're bitter on-track rivals. The top runners will tell you that regardless of the friendships that they have off the track, and uh, they are able to gather, have lunch, have breakfast together, and uh, enjoy a game of racquetball or handball, once they get on the racetrack, all of that is forgotten. Like Damon Bradshaw says, hey, the guy didn't send me no Christmas card, so I got to dislike him, and Bradshaw takes the checkered flag, takes the win in heat race number three. 17-year-old Damon Bradshaw dominating the two big stars of Team Honda, Johnson and Stanton, Larry Ward and Jason Upshaw round out the top five. We'll be back with more qualifying for that big main event right after this. Welcome back. This is the first semi-final event of two. Now, these are the riders that did not make it into the main event through their qualifying heats held earlier today. This is Jeff Matasevich, rider number 20. He's looking for one of the spots on the starting gate. Now, only the top two make it into the main event. 
And here's a great battle for that other spot. Fred Andrews inside takes over the runner-up position from veteran Keith Bowen. Good battle here. Now, remember, they are racing for second and third, but only one of them will be able to advance along with Matasovic should he hang on and win this thing. And these guys are getting at it good, Larry. Well, you talk about a pressure situation. If you don't make it here, Dave, you do have one more opportunity to qualify, and that, of course, is the last chance qualifier. But, boy, that is a pressure-loaded situation. You'll have 20 riders on the gate. Only one makes it out of that last chance. Here, at least, you have two cracks at it. Let's talk a little bit about the backing that these guys have. In the case of Fred Andrews, it's primarily from his dad's motorcycle shop back in Salem, Ohio. In the case of number 24, Keith Bowen, he's supported by a company called Tough Racing, the Tough Racing Suzuki. Both these are Suzuki motorcycles. You note that the machines themselves are painted yellow with the distinctive garb of Bowen a reflection of his company. Over the years, the manufacturers have been very uh, persistent in keeping their colors consistent on the racetrack. The Hondas are always red, the Suzukis are always yellow, the Kawasaki's are always green, the Yamahas are always white. The independent riders like these guys try to add their own bit of flair in their uniform. Andrews found a little flair from Bowen on the inside there as Keith comes by to take over that second spot. Keith Bowen has been around this business for a good number of years, comes out of Pontiac, Michigan. At one time, a factory rider and he was tapped to become a national champion along the way though Bowen either lost some of the drive some of the initiative that it takes to reach out and grab that extra few inches of uh, space to make that extra pass and Bowen has uh, settled back into the ranks of a semi privateer puts forth some excellent efforts and turns in some good performance and right now it looks like it's going to be Bowen no here comes Andrews to the outside which one of them are going to take this final spot Matasevich well out in front is going to uh, for sure make it into the main event but that second spot is still anyone's ball game right now Keith Bowen number 24 on that tough racing Suzuki has the edge and there is Matasevich rider number 20 aboard the Kawasaki from La Habra Heights California he's just flat and left the rest of this field as he kind of coast up to the final jump and over the finish line and crosses it up and that's always spectacular day style a little bit Bowen will hang on and beat Andrews in the race for second and third That'll send Bowen to the main event, Andrews, Hawthorne, and McElroy to the last chance qualifier. It's a tough way to go, but it's still one more shot at qualifying for that main. That's where the points and the money come from. Now, here's a look at semifinal number two. Number 961, Derek Rowe out of Fort Wayne, Indiana, leads the way right behind him. Number 56, the Canadian national champion and one of the top privateers on the circuit for a good number of years, Ross Pedersen. They're being pushed by the KTM of Keith Johnson. The semifinal action is as good as you're going to find anywhere. Same story as in semi number one. You've got three guys going for two spots here with Johnson playing catch. Oh, he clobbered Pedersen, ran right into his rear wheel, put Pedersen on the ground. Johnson will inherit the second spot. Pedersen scrambles back aboard. Take another look at it. Johnson's got his momentum up. Pedersen stopped in front of him. Johnson says, thank you very much. I'm out of here. That's one of those incidents where the guy that was hit, in this case, Ross Pedersen, will claim that he was doing everything right and he was rammed from behind. Keith Johnson is going to say, hey, I was just racing, and that's part of racing luck. But it looked to me like Johnson may have been a little out of control. Now watch coming up, and you'll see what I mean. Look Ooh. at that action, Dave. Unbelievable. we got to see this again. Watch the guy's head as the rear wheel lands. This is Johnson. Bang. He actually hit his face on the handlebar guard, and it knocked him about half dingy. He managed to keep it on two wheels. Nice piece of work there, but I think you're right, Larry. I think maybe he is a little out of control. <laughs> well, watch him come off the top of that jump. He's back under control now. Let's hope he keeps it that way. In any event, he's putting on a great show for the paying customers here in the Houston Astrodome. There's another rider that's putting on a great show, number 961, Derek Rowe. He took the whole shot in this one, semi number two, and he's on his way to the win. The battle, though, for the number two position is not over. That's Ross Pedersen coming back and coming back with a vengeance. Jonathan knocked him off earlier. He's coming back for a grudge. Man. And unfortunately, when you come back with a grudge in mind, it hurts. Watch this. Oh, Off the side of the track, hits a bale. Let's take another look at it, Dave. And I have to think that that probably was caused because of revenge. Well, he got a little out of sync, as you see, and got the front wheel nosed over. You really can't steer the motorcycle. He went into the bales and over the handlebars. He's up and okay. He is okay, but he's not going to make it into that main event through the semifinal. Number 961, Derek Rowe, Fort Wayne, Indiana, takes the checkered flag and the win. 
Kate Johnson gets that other transfer spot as Pedersen falls to fifth behind Chris Young and Clay Hohenschel. Now, all is not lost for Young, Hohenschel, and Peterson. They didn't make it out of their semifinal into the main, but they do have one last chance, and it's called the last chance qualifier quite appropriately. Out in front, rider number 18, Fred Andrews. Only the winner makes it into the main. Come back and check the battle for second here. You've got uh, Brian McElroy out of Florida, John Dowd of Massachusetts, a Suzuki versus a Kawasaki. Dowd looks to the inside while McElroy goes up high. Here they come down through the whoops, and right in front of Dowd goes McElroy. That breaks Dowd's drive. McElroy will run to second, but it really doesn't matter because only the winner of this one goes on, and that winner by a mile is Fred Andrews. Keeps himself in shape in the off-season racing cross-country event, and it pays off here. McElroy, Dowd, Young, and Hodges round out the top five. They're headed for home. A lot of Suzuki's in that one. And with that, qualifying for round two of the Camel Supercross Series is history. We'll be underway with the main events very shortly. But, Dave, there's a Supercross Series here within the Camel Supercross Series. I want to give you some names to remember for the future. These are amateur riders who raced in their own event here in Houston, part of a series that is run in conjunction with several of the pro Supercross races. And in addition to trophies, these kids are competing for the opportunity to run the Amateur Supercross National Championship in conjunction with the Camel Supercross Race in Oklahoma in June. Stars of the future right here, and we can't wait to see them graduate to the pro ranks. Welcome back to the Houston Astrodome. I'm Larry Myers. With me, Dave Despain. If you've just tuned in, this is the Camel Supercross Series. You've missed a lot of action, but there is still plenty yet to come. In fact, Dave, there is so much to come that, well, I'm going to get tired just watching. <laughs> Larry, you and I are in no shape to be racing Supercross. Shape is a key issue here. This is one of the most physically demanding sports in the world. It takes a rigid training program to be able to excel in this sport. And to check out the training program of one of the big stars, we spent some time with Ricky Johnson. Well, I'm working with the next uh, football player who's doing all natural bodybuilding right now, and uh, he's he's basically my strength coach, and uh, we do a lot of dumbbell aerobics. Uh, we put together good music, so it uh, gets you fired up uh, emotionally, so uh, you feel you got a charge for your workout. And also, he helps me with weightlifting and also my nutrition. I also work on uh, different weightlifting machines like Nautilus equipment, Polaris equipment, and uh, also free weights. Um, I feel that you need to work out the muscles in different situations uh, in case you come up with, uh, say, a crash or, or uh, you, you pull your leg a certain way or strain your knees. So it helps keep the total fitness and uh, keeps, your, keeps your structure intact. Running, I feel, is a lot like a supercross or motocross event in that there's no time to rest when you're, out, when you're running. Uh, when you climb hills, it, it's, it's tearing up your lungs and, and it's really hard on the leg muscles. But once you get to the top, you got to run down the other side. So there's really no time to just completely relax your, your muscles. And that's, uh, that's the important thing that running does is it's a continuous pounding on your body that uh, strengthens you mentally. Bicycling, what you're trying to do basically is work out your legs and your lungs and, and your heart as much as possible. The good thing about cycling is, is there's no hard pounding like there is in running, but uh, I feel the thing that it lacks is the consistent uh, hard pace that, uh, that running does do for you. And bicycling, you know, climbing a hill is very hard, but once you get to the downhill, you have a tendency to want to coast. Uh, it's just natural, but the, the benefits of bicycling is keeping the joints lubricated and uh, you can do very controlled workouts with it. And this is where all of that training pays off. We're down to the main event in the 125cc class. We have not watched any of the qualifying for the 125s. Their procedure is similar to that of the 250. Keep your eye on the starting gate. When it drops, the riders will be underway, and one of them gets caught. Bill Lawrence got trapped in the gate. Those sections drop individually. If you try to leave early, it'll trap your front wheel. It's a self-inflicted penalty on Lawrence. The leader is Ty Davis. It doesn't pay to try to gain the upper edge on the starting line. You have to time that perfectly. Lawrence did not do that. Davis, number 26, the early lead. He's followed by Barry Carson on the Suzuki, number 48. Behind the front runners, a whole passel of great young 125 riders. Jeff Emmy, Buddy Antonez, Mike Jones, Denny Stevenson. I think as this race unfolds, we'll see something from all of them. But right now, Ty Davis has things well under control. Starts to 
and try to put the pressure on, but he's got to be concerned about Emig. Look at the Army coming behind him. Davis, for the moment, in control on the Honda. Very smooth, picking good lines and actually pulling away just a little bit. The 125cc class, if you will, is a training ground. These are the youngsters. It's their chance to shine in front of the huge audiences on super cross tracks without having to jump right into the middle of uh, the Jeff Stantons, the Jeff Wards, and the Rick Johnsons. They race with other riders of the same caliber, and they put on one heck of a show. The guy on the move is Amick. He's trying to keep that pressure on Karsten to take over that second spot. When we talk about the Damon Bradshaws of this series being rookies, keep in mind that they are only rookies in the featured 250 class. They're all graduates of this 125 competition from a year ago, so they do have a lot of Supercross experience. These guys are getting that experience this year and will move up into the 250 class next season. A rider that's not waiting to move up is Michael Craig. He got a bad start, but he's moving through the pack. He was the winner of the 125 class one week ago. When we returned, more exciting 125 action. Truly leader on the red motorcycle, Ty Davis is fading, currently running fourth. Out in front on that green Kawasaki, he just flashed by as Jeff Emick. He's followed by Denny Stevenson aboard the yellow Suzuki. There is a shot of Emick, and there is Stevenson. Let's take a look back at what transpired while we were away for commercial. Here's the pass for the lead. Ty Davis goes wide, gets into that hay, and gets the rear wheel spinning. Emick cuts by on the inside to take the lead. Davis lost his rhythm and just kept backing up. And so as a result, Emick is now your leader, and he has pulled out a pretty substantial uh, advantage here, looking very smooth. Behind him, the bike number 27, the Suzuki, belongs to Denny Stevenson out of Omaha, Nebraska. Stevenson has been on the move, just as Emig has. The two of them have come up through the pack, and behind them, number 43, the third rider. We mentioned him earlier, Michael Craig, last week's winner. Now, Craig has come from a long way back. He has the momentum, the drive going for him. It's a real dogfight between these first three positions. There you can see the gap now that separates all three riders. Keep in mind that Craig indeed has had to come a lot further to get into this battle. As Emick tries to hold off Stevenson, I suspect neither of them is aware that Craig is putting on that charge. They're going to be surprised when this becomes a three-man race. Momentum is an important part of any kind of racing, and this case it all belongs to Michael Craig he's coming from out of the pack he's finding new lines and actually riding faster than the two riders in front of him Jeff Emig the leader number 36 and he's being followed closely by Denny Stevenson but again Michael Craig is coming up it's going to be interesting Stevenson is doing this exactly right he's not following Emig where Emig goes Stevenson goes looking for another line you can get trapped into following a guy and your mindset goes all wrong you've got to constantly look for the opening put in the pressure you may not choose the the best line, but you want to show that guy a wheel and let him know you're back there and try to keep him off balance. In addition to keeping him off balance, by showing him that wheel, you're putting the pressure on him. Now, two ways to make a pass. One, you take the gamble. You try to move the other rider out of the way. When you do that, you could end up on the ground. Both riders, in fact, could end up on the ground. The second way is putting the pressure on and hope that, that rider in front of you will make a mistake. That's what Stevenson would like right now. He'd like to see Emig make some kind of an error that would allow him to make the pass cleanly. Now look at this, Dave. I think he's tired of waiting. He's trying to force the issue. A new line through the whoops. They were faster, but it put him way wide for this double, and he's not going to be... In fact, he missed the double completely. Oh, no, Mike Craig jumped right on top of Denny Stevenson. I can't believe Stevenson's getting up. Let's take another look at that. Yeah, you're going to look at a lucky man right here. Stevenson was taken wide by Emick Bang. He got the front end nose first, lost the handlebars. Craig has already committed, and Bang just missed his head from the way Stevenson and reacts. I think he took most of that impact on his right arm and also going down is last week's winner, the 43, Mike Craig. Emig's all alone out front. Wow. All Emig has to do is keep it on two wheels and he's going to rob home the winner in this one. This is a combined east and west 125 race. Now the country is divided geographically into eastern and western regions for the 125 class. But two of them occur right in the middle. This one here in Houston and one later in the season in Dallas. So the east coast riders and the West Coast riders get together for one big heyday. And today I have to say that the West Coast in the person of Jeff Emig is uh, showing the short way around the racetrack to the Easterners. Fun to be that far ahead. You don't have to worry about anything but lap riders and with his lead he really doesn't have to even get up and mix it up with those guys. Emig of course had bad luck last week. He crashed himself out of the, the season's opener. He comes back to win this week and now we've seen the alternative to that because Craig won a week ago. We've seen him
rim crash tonight. Point standings are going to go all up in the air for the West Coast guys. Yeah, both of those riders are in the West Coast as Emick is going to coast now to the final jump. Here he comes up to the face of that finish. Look on that. Boy, that's a little bit on a radical side for a 125cc rider. Jeff Emick wins it. Ty Davis second. Buddy Antonez turns in a strong ride to finish third. Steve Lampson was fourth. Barry Karsten, who earlier challenged for the lead, ended up in that number five position. Here we go to the winner's platform. That's Ty Davis on the left, Jeff Emig in the middle, your winner, and Buddy Antonez on the right. Actually, Antonez also comes out of this a winner, as we'll see in a moment. We're going to look at the point standings for the regions now. The Eastern Regional Riders making their first appearance, so even though Karsten finished fifth in the race, he's tops in the points over Jones, Volan, Goodman, and Buell. As we look at the Western standings, Buddy Antonez, with two consistent finishes, comes out with the lead. Davis Emig, who's a winner but also a loser last week, running third, Lewis and Pryor round out the order. And we'll be right back with the main event after this. Welcome back. You're watching Supercross action from the Houston Astrodome. The 250cc main event is just about to get underway. And you know how you can tell, Dave, because down on the starting line, riders and mechanics alike are doing something that looks like uh, a mating dance. <laughs> Let me see if I can shed some light on that, Larry. The start is critical in this kind of race. The tracks are tight. It's hard to pass. In order to get a good start, you incorporate the help of something called the Supercross Stomp. When you see us stomp in the dirt, what we're doing is basically stomping down our starting position to try to raise the level of the of the dirt so we're shooting straight over the gate and we're not starting in a hole. Uh, it's kind of a nervous twitch also, but more than anything, it's just to prepare our starting spot. Seems to me like if there's a rut there and you line up crooked in that rut or something, you might, be, you might spin sideways. So I basically try to get the rut out of it and get it packed down real solid to get some real good traction. Uh, it helps pack the dirt. It kind of depends on the ground. Some ground, it don't do any good to pack it because it's too hard. But uh, if you're able to pack the dirt in the rut, it makes it more level and, you know, gives you a little more traction if it's packed down. And where did those ruts come from in the first place? Well, if they'd used Supercross motorcycles on the Alaska Pipeline Project, they could have dug all those ditches in half the time. Filling the ruts for traction, though, is not the only reason for the Supercross stomp. I'm preparing to start. I'm always thinking about the start, and uh, I always try to picture myself going around the first corner first. It's, it's just, it just helps me relax and uh, to think about what I've, I've got to do for the next 20 laps. And, of course, the next 20 laps is the main event. It's just about to get underway, but before it does, let's meet some of the contenders. Johnny O'Mara, new to Kawasaki this year, longtime veteran of this series, fourth ranked last year. Doug Dubach, he's still with Team Yamaha, one of two Yamaha riders. The doctor is looking for his first Supercross win. And speaking of doctors, this guy's seen more than his share. Ricky Johnson still trying to heal up from that wrist, the most successful Supercross racer ever. And there's the defending Supercross champion, Jeff Stanton from Sherwood, Michigan. Finally, the young hero that everybody's looking at tonight, winner of the season's opener, the rookie Damon Bradshaw. They're on the start line and ready to go. This is the 250cc main event. The Coors Extra Gold Super Challenge from Houston. We're in the Astrodome. I'm Larry Myers. With me, Dave Despain. Countdown to the start well inside the 30-second mark. Not to belabor the point, I think the big question has to be, can the veterans do anything with Damon Bradshaw? We're ready to go. When that car turns sideways, that's the signal. The riders now looking at that gate. When it drops, they go. It's dropped. They're underway. Out of the middle of the pack, I can see Larry Ward, number 17, aboard the Suzuki. Ward has stolen the whole shot from the veterans. Another kid. This is only his third professional season. He's a rookie in the class. He's got the biggest stars of Supercross behind him. Dubak moves up into second spot on number seven. And alongside the inside, in the green, is Johnny O'Mara. And here comes Damon Bradshaw. He won the opening round. As you pointed out earlier, he's the top of the Supercross circuit. And the moves he's making right now shows why. There's O'Mara now in fourth. There's Jeff Stanton running up into number five position. The pack sorting themselves out as lap number one is well underway. Larry Ward is your leader. Johnny O'Mara running second on the number nine green Kawasaki. In third, let's correct that call I almost made. It was Dubach, but Bradshaw going under that tunnel jump took over the number three position. Now Bradshaw up high. Dubach tries to get it back, but Bradshaw has got the momentum in the drive. Bradshaw number eight settles into third. There's your leader, Larry Ward. Bradshaw will set his sights on O'Mara now youthful exuberance. He just doesn't want to follow anybody on this racetrack. 
18 years old, winner a week ago at Anaheim, working on the number nine of Omari. He'll take the high line, trying to close in on what is now second spot. Now, generally, Dave, when a rider gets off in the first three, four, even five positions, he's content to follow and study another rider's line before he tries to make the pass. That's not the case with these younger riders, Bradshaw, Ward. These guys are all over the racetrack. They're not waiting for anyone. They try to make uh, that pass. They try to force the pass just as early in the ball game as they can. Larry Ward out front. This is only his third professional season. He is one of this incredible new crop of youngsters who have dominated this series thus far. Bradshaw, the guy everybody's looking at after that win in Anaheim, but Ward out front and pulling away a little from Omar. These kids are something. Behind him in the number two spot, it's still Omar, but look at Bradshaw putting the pressure on. Now you get some kind of an idea of the gap between first and second. There's Ward, rider number 17 aboard that Suzuki, and here we come with a runner. Oh, look at that! That has been a double jump all night long. All night a double jump. Bradshaw got some power. He found a triple out of it. He blew by O'Mara in the air. If your name is O'Mara, you have to look up and say, wow, what was that? That's just pure courage right there. Guys with O'Mara's experience, and that includes not only racing experience, but crashing experience, won't take that move. The 17-year-old kid says, I can triple that thing. Grabbed a big handful, and he's second. Again, we have to look at the fact that we're in the early laps on this main event. And uh, I, I don't know if it was a good move or a bad move. You have to say that he came out in second, so I guess uh, it was a good move, no matter how you look at it. Well, results are what count, Larry, but the risk in the kind of racing that these kids are doing is the risk of injury, because it's so easy to fall off. The veterans know that. They're a little more conservative. Amara has had knee problems over the years. He's finally healthy again, but he's not willing to take that risk of getting hurt again. Bradshaw doesn't know hurt. He figures he's invincible. He knows he won a week ago. He wants to do it again, so he just blew by Johnny O. Well, Bradshaw has 16 or 17 laps remaining in this main event. There's an awful long time, but he's not wasting any of it. He has his sights set on the rear wheel of Larry Ward. He wants to catch him as quickly as he can, and uh, if I know Bradshaw, I guess make the pass as quickly as he can. Well, Ward is very impressive because he's put a big gap on this kid. Bradshaw was the hero last week, and Ward wants to be this week. O'Mara undoubtedly frustrated as he sees perhaps visions of his career 10 years ago disappearing in front of him. He can remember what it was like to be the young hero, but it's been a long time ago. But what Bradshaw is doing for O'Mara right now, showing him the short way around the racetrack, is he's telling him, look, you can ride just a little bit faster, and indeed, O'Mara has picked up his pace. Now, there's an old saying in racing, you don't know how fast you can go until you get beat or crash, one of the two. So until O'Mara sees how fast these kids are going, he's going to be, well, tiddling around at that same pace that he's been riding for the past couple of years. For Larry Ward, this is an important season. He was dropped by Honda last year in a racing team cutback. Suzuki picked him up. He needed just one race to get the feel of the motorcycle. Here's Bradshaw coming after him. He's a longtime Yamaha campaigner. Ward's got to do well early in this campaign to justify Suzuki's confidence. And I'll tell you what, I think he's doing just fine. And we'll be back with more action from the Houston Astrodome. Let me Dave to Spain. We're in the Houston Astrodome for the Coors Extra Gold Super Challenge. It's round two of the Camel Supercross Series. Larry Ward on the yellow motorcycle, rider number 17, is the leader. He took the whole shot, and he's not been headed, but right behind him, Damon Bradshaw. 44,000 people going nuts as the kids have at it. 19-year-old Larry Ward, 17-year-old Damon Bradshaw, running away from the veterans the second week in a row. But those guys have struggled. Bradshaw inside. You going to get him, Larry? He did get him. Look at that. No! Here comes Ward back. I thought that Bradshaw had the pass made, but Ward dialed it in, and look at this. Bradshaw found an inside line over the whoops, and he again makes the pass. This time, he makes it stick. Momentum the issue. Bradshaw looking back, kind of a na 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 look, I think, there, as he definitely put the move on Ward. Ward is hanging on his rear wheel, but Bradshaw has, remember, come from fourth to lead the race. Ward led it all the way. Here's the battle that's raging now among number seven, Doug Dubach, number one, Jeff Stanton, and this is the other Ward. This is Jeff Ward, number three. No relation to Larry. Okay, now that's the battle for the number four position. Johnny O'Mara is tucked up in third. He's all alone right now. Dubach in fourth. 
fourth, Stanton fifth, Jeff Ward in sixth, back to the leaders, and Damon Bradshaw would like to pull away, but Larry Ward is not letting him go. Ward has the uh, Yamaha still in his sight, and uh, he says, hey, if you're going to run away with this one, you're taking me with you. We saw it a week ago when we saw Bradshaw battling Matasevich. Matasevich didn't give up when Bradshaw came by, actually came back and retook the lead. They ended up swapping that lead back and forth. Larry Ward needs very much to stay close to Bradshaw to demonstrate to Bradshaw that he can ride as fast as he can. In this battle for the number four position, Doug Dubach is doing the demonstrating. There goes Jeff Ward around the outside. Ward is trying to take over the number five spot from Stanton, and it looks to me like he made the pass. He's going to make it stick, and Jeff Ward has taken over the number five position. Stanton drops back to sixth. The defending champ has not made out all that well in the opening rounds of this Supercross series, and I wonder if you're Jeff Stanton. Are you worried about it at this point? I, he said he was going to ride conservatively, Larry. I don't think he was prepared for the demonstration of speed that we've seen from this kid, Damon Bradshaw, from his running mate up front, Larry Ward. I think, as you pointed out earlier, these kids have upped the ante in terms of what it takes to win at Supercross. You've just got to run a little bit faster than the Wards and the Johnsons have had to run in the past. At the head of that jump section, Bradshaw looked over his shoulder at Ward as if to say, come on, I've got just a little bit left. And so does Jeff Ward. Ward powering to the outside of Doug Dubach. He's trying to take the measure of Dubach. That's where he passed Stanton just one lap ago. And Ward is going to make this one stick. He's got the inside line. Jeff Ward takes over the number four position. Here comes Dubach right back. Dubach says, no, thank you. I'll have none of that. Doug Dubach is exhibiting riding moves that I've never seen him make. Well, he's definitely come to life in the face of a challenge from Jeff Ward, who's figured out that... Oh, look at that! Doug Dubach had the line, and it looked like Jeff Ward jumped on top of him. We'll need to say this one again in a replay to see exactly what happened, but it looked like Ward come down on top of Dubach. Here's Damon Bradshaw, the leader. Of course, he doesn't have any idea what's happening behind him. Ward commits to the double. Dubach has lost his momentum. Ward just crashes into it. Looks like his right shoulder carries him right up into the traffic. Ward actually falls off the motor cycle they scramble to get going again Jeff Stanton meanwhile moved up to the number four position and here's our leader Damon Bradshaw Bradshaw says whatever is happening behind me as he takes the cross flags indicating the halfway point in the race whatever is happening behind me let it happen I'm just going to keep her pegged wired wide open put as much distance between myself and this fellow Larry Ward running in a number two position as I possibly can Ward's got to maintain his concentration now a week ago once Bradshaw got away Jeff Matasevich's arms up and he fell back to third spot. In this case, Bradshaw is again making a runaway out of it. The new definition of what Supercross racing is all about. Look at the interval back to Larry Ward. Ward has got to maintain his concentration or he runs the risk of falling into the clutches of Johnny O'Mara, who is still third. Speaking of Matasevich, there he is. He's in the number five position following Jeff Stanton, the defending Supercross champ. We'll be right back. This is round two of the Camel Supercross Series. The young man you're watching, that number eight in the motorcycle, it's a Yamaha, is Damon Bradshaw from Charlotte, North Carolina. When the gate dropped for the opening lap, Bradshaw was in the top five or six, quickly moved to the number one spot. Now, this is the battle for fourth, fifth, and sixth. On the green motorcycle, Jeff Potasevich in fourth, right behind him, the defending Supercross champ. Behind him, Mike LaRocco. Damon Bradshaw, of course, is missing all of that action, but somehow or other, I don't think that Bradshaw minds. Uh, the first time you go out and win one of these things, it's a stunning upset, but when you do it two weeks in a row, everybody's got to rethink what this 1990 series is going to be all about. It's about this 17-year-old kid. <laughs> I'd have to agree with that. Here's the battle for the number five spot. It's the defending champ, Jeff Stanton from Sherwood, Michigan, aboard the number one Honda. Right behind him, Mike LaRocco from La Porte, Indiana. Not too far away. In fact, they're almost neighbors, but not neighbors on this racetrack. And now look at this. Number 13, two-time Supercross champ, Rick Johnson, is about to be lapped by our leader, Damon Bradshaw. Rick Johnson is not riding well at all. There, Bradshaw makes the pass. Now, there is a rider that is riding well, Mike LaRocco. Again, LaRocco coming from way out of the pack to move up to the number six position and in the position to challenge Jeff Stanton. Stanton, the defending champ, has got his hands full. LaRocco goes wide. Stanton cuts to the inside. LaRocco has the drive, but Stanton takes the line away. Now, under the tunnel, again, Mike LaRocco tried to find new running room, but Stanton, with his experience, takes the line away from LaRocco. LaRocco fourth to 
ball back behind Stanton. It was a learning experience, though, and I would not expect that Morocco was going to stay there. In fact, Morocco is now making a move to the inside. He pulls even with Stanton. The two of them are hitting that rough section of whoops and double jumps side by side right in front of them. Fourth place, Jeff Matasevic. We've got a real battle on our hands. Three riders, you can throw a blanket over them. Matasevic must be here in fourth step. That battle still side by side as Morocco tries to use the inside line to eventually gain the advantage. Stanton doing his best to hang on finally gives up the spot. And let's take a moment to put this age and experience thing into perspective. We keep talking about Stanton as one of the series veterans. He is that, but he's only 21 years old. The point is, he has a lot of time on factory motorcycles as a member of one of the top teams. Morocco, number 10, is 20 years old. Matasevich is 20 years old. Ricky Johnson, the gnarly old veteran that we've made so much of, is 25. So it's definitely a young man's ball game, and these young men make a whole lot of money playing. Now we see Morocco, number 10, closing in on Matasevich. Matasevich holding down that number four position ahead of him. This man holding down the number one spot, rider number eight, Damon Bradshaw. Behind Bradshaw, we caught just a glimpse of him. Larry Ward on the yellow Suzuki, and there was Ward. But Bradshaw is having things his own way right now. He owns this racetrack. The only battle on the track is for that number four position. It's between Jeff Matasevich on that green Kawasaki, and right behind him aboard the yellow Suzuki, Mike Morocco. Matasevich ran second to Bradshaw a week ago until his arms got kind of tired and he backed up to third. Now he's definitely on the draw. Oh, he's in trouble. He goes down. It looks like he just kind of misplayed that corner. He's throwing up his arms in disgust like maybe it wasn't his fault. We need to take another look at that and find out exactly what happened. Now, Matasevich is unhappy with the last rider that he hit. It's a break for Bradshaw, who has one less contender to deal with here. Take another look at it. I think Matasevich thought he could get to that corner early enough to be able to knock that lapper out of the way. The lapper cut in on him and took his front wheel out. Matasevich found himself on his nose. He just misread it. Well, Arako read it just right. He went way to the outside, missed the carnage, and you can bet if there's anyone on the racetrack right now that uh, is pleased over the fact that Matasevich fell, it would have to be Mike Arako. Damon Bradshaw, our leader. It's been that way for a good number of laps. This one is winding down. We'll be right back. your leader, Damon Bradshaw, running in the number two position, another teenager, Larry Ward, number 17 on the Suzuki. But the story has been all Damon Bradshaw. He's going to coast up that big jump now, takes the white flag, signifying one lap to go in this 20-lap main event from the Houston Astrodome. While we have the chance, we would like to say thank you to SRO Pace, the promoters of this event, and also the folks that are responsible for putting this telecast together. In addition, the fine help that we've had here at the stadium in the Houston Astrodome, the entire staff has been uh, just excellent to us and of course it's made our job a lot easier. Let's tip the hat too to the American Motorcyclist Association. They sanction all these big races but they do a lot more for the individual motorcyclists around the country watching out for your right to ride. How about Damon Bradshaw? Wave into the crowd headed for home. He's going to be one of the American Motorcyclist Association heroes of the future as he establishes in this 1990 Supercross season a new definition for riding excellence in the stadium. The way Bradshaw rides reminds me of a pair of I asked him, why would you jump out of a perfectly good airplane? Bradshaw lets go of the handlebars in the air. He did it one more time. A cross-up and a checkered flag, and he is happy. There's Larry Ward, his best Supercross finish ever. Running in a number three position, Johnny O'Mara, the Kawasaki rider. Mike LaRocco finished fourth. Rounding out the top five, Jeff Stanton, the current Supercross champion. Sixth place goes out to Ronnie Tister. Mike Kedrowski finishes seventh. Dubak, Matasevich Fisher rounding out the field. Let's go to Damon Bradshaw. Yeah, Larry rode really good in the main. You know, he stayed right there within striking distance. And uh, I want to keep that certain pace going and just try to keep a certain amount of seconds out there. I didn't want to ride over my head, and uh, yet I want to ride fast. And... You know, everything clicked for me again tonight. I got off to a decent start and made my passes smooth and uh, went on to take the win. Two rounds down of the Camel Supercross Series. 16 to go. Bradshaw on top with a perfect score. Right behind him, another rookie, then the first veteran, Johnny O'Mara. Three guys with three different reasons to smile. On the right, the veteran Johnny O'Mara with a new lease on his racing life. On the left, Larry Ward with his best finish ever. And in the middle, still undefeated king of the Supercross, young Damon Bradshaw with the champagne. You know, Dave, Bradshaw has probably squirted more champagne than you and I have guzzled. <laughs> <laughs> the kid's got to spray it, Larry. He's only 17. He's not yeah. old enough to drink it. Last week, I thought his victory at Anaheim was an incredible upset. I mentioned at the top of this hour that it might have been a fluke. This was no fluke. He's made it two in a row. 
the kid knows where he's going, right to the top of the Supercross heap. And I think the question now is whether there's anybody out there who's man enough to stop him. Well, the question in my mind still remains, when will the veterans pop up? Uh, that's got to be the number one question. We'll find out next week if they can do it there or not. We're heading for Jack Murphy Stadium in round three. That's in San Diego. So be sure to tune in. I'm Larry Myers for Dave Despain. We'll see you next week right here on ESPN.